You are in the uh, in the presence of author royalty. Now, how many people do you know that can claim to have written 27 books in their lifetime? Uh, Ken Johnson is a uh, is a machine. The thing I like about him is he creates books that are to the point. You know, you get some of these books where they have all these blank pages in them and big, huge print, and they stretch them out so they're 400-page books and you think to yourself, this could have been a 200-page book. <laughs> Ken writes concise books that people are able to read quickly, like most of us. Uh, we don't have time to spend eight hours reading a book. And he writes on subjects that not only are interesting, but which are relatively unknown. All the work of the ancient church fathers is actually really, really important. Uh, the late J.R. Church used to spend enormous amounts of time study in the church fathers, and he would find all kinds of nuggets in their teachings uh, that really brought out a lot of what the early uh, apostles and the early church believed. Uh, Ken's new book, Gad the Seer, that you're going to be hearing about today, is just came completely out of the blue. No one even knew who Gad was. How many people here had actually heard of Gad before Ken's message? Yeah, we've got some scholars here, but I have to admit I had to look it up. And when you start to study it and study the relationship with King David, uh, you're going to really enjoy his message today. He's working on a new book that I want you to talk about and just let people know what it is. It's almost finished about the patriarchs and some of the early prophecies they wrote that they handed down to their children, uh, which he's discovered in these scrolls, which, you know, Ken is a really mild-mannered, soft-spoken guy. But when he started talking about some of these new things, my wife looked at me and she said, What's got into Ken Johnson? I've never seen him so excited. So anyway, wonderful guy, great writer. I know you're going to enjoy it. Okay, good morning. Glad to see you all here. It's nice to come to Colorado, or um, uh, this place rather than Colorado. That's funny. In Colorado, I can't breathe too well, and I stutter, so now I don't know. Anyway. Well, God bless you. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, basically, what I've been doing uh, over the last 11 years is I started off reading the Church Fathers, just like J.R. Church did. And I have the funny way my professor is, is the same way. You read something, and then you don't read it very far until you're, I wonder really what this means. So when you read in the scriptures where, you know, David had a prophet named Gad, and he wrote a book of prophecy. We'll see that in a minute. You stop and you think, well, wait a minute, that's not in the scripture, so where is it at? If we actually wrote something, I, I would like to read that, you know, wouldn't you? So where did it go? Why is it not here? And of course, the answer to all of those, everybody tells you, well, they just don't exist anymore. Nobody knows what they are. Or, well, Gad and Nathan probably put all their stuff together and it's really chronicles. How many of you have heard that one, you know? Book of the Wars of the Lord. It's probably the Book of Kings. You know, it's like, no, it's not. So, but it's interesting. So I started reading that, researching those things, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, come out, and um, many of you probably realize 60, 70 percent of those are just copies of Scripture. And then there's the Community Scroll, which is interesting. It's how they live their life and things like that. But then there's those extra little things in the back that nobody ever talks about. And the problem is that the scholars will look at it and go, Messiah came wonder who they thought a messiah was. Well, maybe the founder of the cult. Yeah, who knows who that was, you know, and they just toss it. You know, and we're going, whoa, hold on. Maybe it was really messiah. I happen to believe in Bible prophecy, literally. You know, and most of the scholars do not. So we rely on them, and we shouldn't. We should say, that's nice, thank you. Now, can you go away and just give me the scroll? <laughs> that, that's what we want to do. Give us the text. You know, commentary too, but give us the text. So, yeah, he was uh, talking about the, the new book I'm working on. It's going to, going to be called The Ancient Testaments of the Patriarchs. What happened was in, the, in uh, well, the, I think it was the Armenian church have in their canon the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. You've probably heard of that. It's supposed to be the writings of the Twelve Sons of Jacob. It has a little bit of Bible prophecy, a little bit of uh, what, what to give to your kids, moral lessons, stuff like that. It was thought to be Christian fiction because it's very, very Christ-centered. It doesn't sound like something that would be real from a long time ago. So I remember studying it in seminary, and we thought, oh, this is great if it was real, but you know, probably not, so we set it aside. 
But then in studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, do you know that five out of those 10, or uh, out of the 12 rather, are exist, actually exist in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Now think about that for a minute. That's at least 100 to 200 BC. That's not Christian fiction, right? There's no Christians yet. If it's, if it's fiction, it's a scene fiction. So you could go that route, but you can't blame us. So it's interesting. So then you look at this and you go to the Talmud. I thought this was fascinating because the Talmud said there's this legend, and who know, you know, the legends, who knows, but the legend is from Adam all the way to Aaron, the patriarchs, that lineage, Adam, Seth, you know, all the way down. They were prophets. They wrote what they call the Testaments, which are mainly moral lessons, what you want your kids to know, like I messed up with alcohol, I messed up with this. Don't follow my example, do this, you know. Remember when Messiah comes, make sure to do this. And so it's got Bible prophecy in it too. And the Testaments, they were supposed to be very accurate prophets, everything's great, but the Talmud will tell you that it's true, but not a single Testament exists, and we don't know what it was or what was taught by the school of Shem or the school of Elijah or any of that kind of stuff. But then you get to the Dead Sea Scrolls and there's no history about, or there's no, the legends aren't there, but the scrolls are there. You know, and so we've got some 20 of these testaments. So I'm putting those together. Uh, it's amazing the type of things they talk about. It goes along with Gad too. Gad's a totally different uh, animal by itself. But that's what we're working on. There's gonna be a couple more Dead Sea Scroll translations come out next year. Aren't you excited? Yes. Yeah. The cool thing about these is sometimes you and I will not necessarily learn anything new because a lot of these things focus on the first coming of the Messiah. That was at the end of their age. We're looking for the rapture, man, you know? People uh, 500 to 600 years into the millennium are gonna be going, yeah, rapture, that was cool. But anyway, <laughs> they're gonna be looking about what's at the end of my age, you know? So we're all excited about that. But the cool thing about it is so many of these books come out of these scrolls they're not Christian, obviously, because they're pre-Christian. They talk about Messiah in the way that Christians do. So our theology came from the Essenes, and the current rabbinical stuff is from the Pharisees, and even the history is recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, I mean, what do you do with that if you're Jewish? And the Messiah is not, not Jesus. You guys invented it. Well, no, we didn't. You did, actually, 2,000 years ago. But what about that? You know, always go back to Daniel 9. What about that? The Messiah is supposed to come before Titus destroys the temple. Well, he didn't come. So Daniel's a liar? No, no, no. God just changed his mind. <laughs> so God, being omniscient, knowing you're going to tick him off, and he's going to change his mind and not send the Messiah, went ahead and sent an angel to a prophet to lie, basically, to the prophet, saying, I'm going to send him, even though I know I'm not going to. God's not a liar, says so in scripture, or this son of a man that he should repent. That doesn't make any sense. There's some prophecies that talk about, if you do this, then I'll do this. That's understandable. We mess up, he doesn't do it. But when he says, guess what? I'm gonna do this. I don't care if you like it or not. This is when it's gonna happen, and this is what's gonna happen. You know, and Satan and all the entire universe can't stop it because I decree it. Then if he doesn't do it, he's a liar, and we're told that that's not possible. Anyway, well, let's get to the subject at hand. Uh, I want to introduce you to the book of Gad the Seer, and we've, have a, uh, we've had a really good uh, amount sold, but we still have some out there. But let's just look at this. This is really interesting to me, and I'd heard legends about this over uh, the years, and there's been a couple of chapters floating around the Internet. And last year I wrote a book, uh, The End Times by the Church Fathers, and I went through and found... Uh, three small books on end time prophecy by the church fathers, I was looking for new things. So in other words, yeah, they believe in a pre-trib rapture, they believe in an, an antichrist in a seven year period and a second coming and the stuff like we do, but did they give us any extra information? You know, so I'm going through looking for these things and they told us things like where they, they think the antichrist would be born in a couple of the 10 nations. You know, if we can identify even one of the 10 nations, that, that's a major thing to all of a sudden start looking at. You know, just some itty bitty clue like that might really open the entire book of Revelation to us, you know. So I'm looking for these things and some of that's in there, but then they'll quote these prophecies about the fall of the Roman Empire and stuff like that. And I'm like, where did we get that? Well, the apostles taught me. Okay, but yeah, but still, what did, 
where is it written? You know, so you've got to kind of research these things. So I was doing that, and last uh, this conference we had last year, I told many people that I'm looking for the book of Gad the Seer. And so shortly thereafter, after the conference was over, I got contacted by a friend. And uh, basically, I have a friend in Cochin, India now that uh, is kind of helping me to try to get some of these things. So let's look at this. Suffice it to say, somehow it accidentally wound up in my hands. So let's look at the history of it. This is pretty interesting. What is this Gad the Seer? Well, who is Gad and what is it about? There's a reference in 1 Chronicles 29, 29. And it says, now the acts of King David, or David the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel the seer. We know that's first and second Samuel, book of Samuel. The book of Nathan the prophet, and the book of Gad the seer. Okay, that's cool. So these are prophets, uh, you know, the, and we know from just reading Kings and Chronicles how Gad and Nathan would come to David and say, you need to do this. God's not pleased. You need to do this or, you know, that kind of stuff. So they were prophets, like we think of as prophets, and apparently they wrote books. I like prophetic books, especially ones written by prophets. So I'm looking at this going, you know, and again, they always say, don't add to the canon. I'm not trying to, but I'm also trying to be obedient. The canon is telling us, the Holy Spirit's telling us that there is another book of prophecy, probably set aside for a reason, usually because it needs to be revealed in the end times. But if it's mentioned, how many of us want to read it? Shouldn't we? Yeah. I like commentaries of people that have studied Greek and Hebrew and might enlighten me. I would like a guy that's talked to God to kind of enlighten me. Now, granted, it could be messed up. It's been thousands of years, you know, so always a possibility. Well, the legend is, I started researching this, and it's pretty interesting. There's the legend of the lost five. So there are five prophets that supposedly wrote prophetic books, and these are Nathan, Gad, Ahijah, Shemaiah, and Iddo. Okay, and they wrote prophetical books, we're told to read them, but they're not in the canon. The, the seers or the prophets' books actually start with Samuel. You know, Eli is a, you know, kind of a prophet, and then Samuel, and then you get you know, Elijah and, and on down. But these other guys are pretty interesting, supposedly. Never seen them. But here's the history of the Lost Five. Apparently, uh, when the king of Assyria came down to attack and destroy the, the 10 nations and remove them, or the 10 tribes, uh, this was about 720 BC. Now think about it for a minute. You're a Jew, you, you, everybody's apostatizing, but you're not. You love the Lord, you've been told through the prophets that four generations, and that is it. And so you're sitting there waiting, maybe kind of hoping, and Nothing, you know, nothing changes. The Assyrians come in and wipe out two tribes. Then they come back in, wipe out another two tribes. You know it's going to happen, right? Because you're a believer. You know the prophecies. you got a choice. You want to go into captivity or do you want to go that way? Let's just pick up and move that way. And that's what a group of people did, believers in the prophecies. So there were 460 Israelites okay, uh, that migrated to Yemen by, for safety. And they were safe down there for centuries until, you know, Islam arises and then Islam persecutes Jews. It gets really hot and heavy down there. There's still some Yemenite Jews down there, which makes me wonder what they might have in their canon. That's another subject. Anyway, I need to make a phone call when I get done with this. But anyway, <laughs> these 460 Israelites then go to Yemen. And then persecution from Muslims centuries later drives them to India. Okay, so this was pretty interesting to me. So they settle in, in an area called Cochin, India. It's at the, kind of at the tip of India. And they've been there ever since. And that's not unusual. There are pockets of Jews from all over, you know, everywhere. So, but what's interesting is uh, they have, supposedly, the legends say, they have the lost five. Okay? So what happened was uh, Gad was translated into German in 1786. Very close to the time, you know, 1796. And so we've only been here as a country 200 years. About 200 years ago, this was done. So it's interesting. There was a Jew then that decided he wanted to become a Christian. He did. Decided the book of Gad is important. So he translated it into uh, his language, which was actually Dutch. And then it was translated into German. Um, later on, as this happens, there's more translations made. Uh, another Hebrew version was found. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. A whole text Hebrew version. 
And that was pretty funny too, because I, I got contacted by a friend that said, I heard you're looking for this. You know, I have this, you know, scroll that you want. And I'm thinking it's a, you know, a 15-year-old kid that got the book, you know, Lost Books of the Bible, and, you know, here, this will help you. So I thought it was something like that, but I look at this thing, and it's like, it's, that's the first two chapters, and I keep reading, it's like, this is the whole thing. Oh, my. So, pretty interesting. A modern Hebrew version was produced in 2015 in Israel, and I, don't, I still don't think you can get that over here. Uh, it's not on Amazon anyway. Uh, but then we made a modern English translation of it in 2016 with commentary from a Christian point of view, fundamentalist, Bible-believing, prophecy-loving Christian commentary. That's a mouthful. So that's the history of it, basically. And then here is, is a basic contents of it. And this is pretty interesting. We'll kind of stop and go through some of this. The last chapter I thought was pretty interesting at first. I remember when I first read through it, I'm going through the last chapter, and it just pops out at me. And I tell my wife, you, you, do you see what this says? And she's like, yeah. It's like, do you know what that means? No. It's like, it's this, you know. So I begin explaining it to her. There, there's a legend, a Jewish legend, that says on Yom Kippur, you know, the judgment comes, and, and you're in the, or not on Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and uh, there's a judgment, and hopefully you, you have, you're inscribed for a good year. You know, there's that. Jewish legend. There's a, there's a legend that on that day that books will be open, three sets of books, and there's going to be the book of the, the, the saints, the book of the damned, and the book of the common people. And, you know, if you're not, um, if you're in the book of common people at that point, you're thrown into the book of the damned. So, so it's like you, these guys are done, you know, and these guys made it. These guys, you need to hurry up, make a decision. So, it's kind of an interesting legend, and I always wondered about it because it doesn't quite fit with scripture, but it kind of sort of does, you know. Obviously, that's true. There's a certain point where you need to make a decision or you're going to go to hell, and that's absolutely true. And some of us have already made that decision. The Holy Spirit has stopped working with it, and we're apostate, you know. And we, we don't know who that might be, so we're supposed to pray for everybody. But in this chapter 14, it's pretty interesting because it says at the... The, the scene he sees is Judgment Day. God sets down, the books are opened, and judgment comes. And first, the, it's the book of the righteous, you know, that comes up. And he's looking at this book, and these are the redeemed. It's a pretty interesting term. Redeemed means these guys weren't that good to begin with, but somehow they got forgiven. It's kind of interesting. So you, didn't, don't, you don't see that too often. And Satan appears before the, the Lord and says, do, what are you doing with these sinners? They, they're, they're damned. They should be. And he's told, shut up. <laughs> Pretty cool. An angel actually tells him, this is judgment day. Shut your mouth. So, and then God continued. It was pretty interesting. But see, that tells us something. Satan's actually telling the truth at that point, kind of, sort of. These people really don't deserve what they're getting. They're redeemed. They actually were sinners, probably kind of sort of are. They have that wacky sin nature. That's me, you know, you and me. But so this is, this is what happens. And, and he says, no, these people are redeemed. They receive eternal life today. And I'm thinking, that's interesting, you know, Rosh Hashanah, rapture, eternal life, you know, might be something there. But I keep reading. And then the books of the, of the sinners are opened. And I'm thinking, oh, this is a lot like that Jewish legend, you know, but it's got a twist on it. The, in other words, the Talmud slightly misunderstood Gad's book. But he goes on and he says, Here, here's the book of the sinners. And the Lord looks at it and he says, I'm going to set this book aside. Maybe they'll repent and we'll see. And I'm going to set it aside until one third through the month. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is judgment day. It's Rosh Hashanah. So first of Tishrei, one-third through the month would be what? The 10th. What's the 10th of Tishrei? Yeah, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. I'm thinking, ooh, this is interesting. That's, that's when the Lord would come back to set up the kingdom, if you know the festivals, the festival language. So then he looks at the Book of the Damned, and he, says, he, he points to Satan and says, these are yours. Do with them what you will. And Satan takes them to some sort of a large battle, and they're destroyed. You know, and so I'm looking at this, and, and I'm, I'm, you're probably figuring this out too. This is a perfect picture of a pre-tribulational rapture. 
There are those that, because you're believers, you and I aren't that great of people. I mean, we have a sin nature. We don't want to be, but we're sin nature. But we love the Lord, we repent, we try to follow him. There's going to be a certain day, a certain Rosh Hashanah that actually happens, and we are going to be raptured, given eternal life today. Then there are other people that have to make a decision, and they better make a decision by the time the kingdom comes. And, and so we see that. It's like if you miss the rapture, you got seven years to figure it out, or it, you're toast, you know? So it's interesting to see that. I'm looking at this, reading this, and I know those old legends, and I'm thinking, wow, the Talmud almost had it right. How many times have you read the Talmud and thought, this is cool, and then found out they almost had it right, but they just... It, what it is is you've got rabbis that love the Lord that are filled with the Spirit up to the time of Messiah. Messiah comes. If you reject Messiah, you're not led of the Holy Spirit anymore. And as Paul said, it's like they have blinders on. So their best guess is, yeah, not even worth talking about. Now, if they're talking about a historical event, there's a record. So there's some really good stuff in the Talmud, but you've got to really shift it, shift through it. So I thought that was really amazing. So let's go ahead and look at a few, a few, look uh, on a few of these and uh, try to get through as many of them as we can until uh, our time is up. But the main thing I want you to see then is the first and the second chapters. And this is pretty amazing. The first and the second chapters have this incredible story of end time prophecy. And let me uh, just give you the picture here. This is a blown up picture of what's on the front, but this is part of a vision that Gad sees. Gad says in the first chapter, I was praying with the Lord, I was at a certain brook, and the Lord told me to go east of, of Jerusalem and face toward the east. Now the temple's not there yet. This is, remember Gad is in David's time. So David wants to build the temple, starts to get it ready. The Lord says, no, your son will build the temple. So he gets everything ready, David dies. Solomon comes on the scene and builds the temple. So we're looking at what would be the eastern gate. There's no temple yet, probably not even an eastern gate, but this is my idea of what Gad would have seen. So he's looking toward Jerusalem where the temple will be, and he sees this very peculiar thing. He's praying to the Lord, and all of a sudden he hears something moving. So he looks to see what it is, and there are these two oxen coming up the road. The two oxen are led by a camel and a donkey. And he's thinking, that's very odd. There's no human beings around. And this voice says, this is iniquity. So it's interesting. In this symbolism, then, there's a camel and a donkey, which are people or forces or something that's leading the two oxen, which are later identified as Judah and Israel. So they're leading Israel astray, leading everybody astray. They're pretending to be part of Israel. Uh, they're kind of a replacement theology. They're changing things around, and they're leading into darkness. So what happens then is he watches this then as they come up, and they're going around the road, and then all of a sudden this wind comes up, and it, um, well, first he sees this picture of the sun and the moon, and it's a full moon, and it's a full sun, and the symbolism is pretty interesting. The sun represents, and you figure out this later in the text, the sun represents God's kingdom in heaven. That's where God is. And the moon is simply a reflection of the light of the sun. So it represents the kingdom of Judah on earth. So God's truth, his Torah, uh, his prophecy, the Messiah, everything that God wants to do is known of God and is reflected in Israel. It, we're supposed to all look to Israel for the Messiah. The Messiah comes through Israel. The prophecies are given to the prophets mainly in Israel. Everything is Israel. That's God's point on earth. So if we look to Israel, we see the reflection of God's kingdom, and everything should be great unless something weird happens to Israel, and Israel becomes darkened. Then we can't see the light very well. And this is what happens. He actually sees in the sun a figure of, of, of a person who's a king, and it's actually God. And on God's shoulder is a lamb. And I thought this was pretty interesting. Remember, this is 1,000 BC, but you still have, the symbols are always the same. And that's why I love going back through the Dead Sea Scrolls and seeing the dreams uh, in the books of like Noah and Abraham and the things that they talked about. And the symbolisms are the same and they're explained. So we go through the Old Testament and get up into Revelation and they're not really explained, but it's the same symbols. So you can kind of figure these things out. Well, 
if we're talking about God and his lamb, my wild guess is we're talking about a Messiah, right? You know, so you get to know the symbols. It's not too hard. And the moon is full and it's reflecting the light. Well, something weird happens. This wind comes up and it blows the camel and the donkey into the moon. Okay, and then all of a sudden the moon is darkened and all you see is a sliver of the moon, like a, a crescent moon. But it's not a normal crescent moon because that crescent moons are always like this because the sun just set and it's shining this way. Somehow the crescent moon is like this, which is very weird. That would never really happen. Um, so you've got this crescent moon, which is a symbol of some sort of anti-Semitic group in the end times. Can anybody think of an anti-Semitic group that has a symbol of a crescent moon? Just wild guess, yeah. So again, it, it's pretty interesting. Now, at this point, that's a guess. You know, we want to be fair. It might mean something else. But that's the first thing that comes to mind. So we continue with this. And a camel and a donkey, that's... Eee, that's kind of confusing. So it goes on and we talk about these things. Basically what happens is the Messiah comes and does something. It doesn't say what exactly, but he, it, apparently it's not very pleasant. It's like he's almost tortured or killed or something. But somehow he does something, and because of what he does, he leaves the Father, the Son, comes to earth and does this. And it's interesting, while he's doing this, he's separated from the Father on earth, but it also says that he never left the Father. It's like, how could that be? Oh, I don't know, Trinity maybe, you know. The Father is, you know, all, everything, Colossians tells us, everything that is in the Godhead was in Jesus bodily. So this is pretty interesting. He comes and he does this, and the result of this thing that he does is that this new group of people appear on the earth. They're called the redeemed. It's like, oh, we saw them in chapter 14. They're the cool ones that weren't that great to begin with, but somehow are forgiven. So pretty interesting. And Satan's really mad at us for some reason. So he comes to do this, and basically it says that everything starts out well, but these two creatures continue to cause problems. And the problems they, were, they do are to kind of infiltrate and mix evil and good. They start by taking the good and saying, well, this is good also. It's, it's two separate ways. It's not a big deal. Pretty soon it's like, well, this is okay, but this is much better. And then the, it changes again later and says, this is the way it always has been. I don't know how you got this. And then the last stage is like, this is good and this is evil. It must be destroyed. And it's showing you how things change over time, which is exactly what always happens. You know, Somehow observing the festivals used to be the thing to do. And then it was, well, you can. You know? And it's like, oh, no, you shouldn't. Now, how do we get from we can to we shouldn't? You know. And I'm not saying you guys have to go observe Sabbath or anything like that, but when somebody tells you you can't, it's a sin. How in the world could it be a sin? You know, it's just, just weird, you know. Okay, anyway, especially when you acknowledge Jesus Christ and everything. You know, if you get off and think Jesus isn't Jesus, then you, you're going to have a problem. But you can do that with anything. But it's interesting. We have this thing, basically this donkey and this camel, whatever they are, this anti-Semitic powers, continues until the Messiah, the, the Lamb, goes back to the Father, and then he from there comes to the moon, and he completely obliterates these two creatures, becomes a full moon again, and then we have basically a kingdom of God on earth. So you can see in the symbolism that the Messiah is going to come, apparently there's two comings, which is pretty cool. He's going to come and do something to create the redeemed, go back. He's going to come back and fix this problem. So that tells us, number one, whatever these two problems are, apparently they're still here. And apparently we can't do a darn thing about it. It takes him to come and destroy them. But still, I want to know who they are. I mean, I don't want to have anything to do with them. So it's pretty interesting looking at this thing. So it goes on. That's basically the end. There's a lot of other things in the chapter, a lot of other sub-prophecies, which are really cool. But that's the prophecy. You get into chapter 2, and chapter 2 gives the explanation to a lot of these things. What's really interesting is, and it ends up, the camel ends up being old Edom. Okay, So if you go to the area of Edom, Saudi Arabia, this is an end-time religious ideological power that is anti-Semitic in the area of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, whatever, has a symbol of a crescent moon. I think we're pretty much done with that, right? That's Islam. 
Yeah, and what else could it be? It's been Islam for a thousand years. I don't think it's going to change overnight. Donkey, on the other hand, is more like a, not a, war, a horse, is a warrior character, but this would be something outside the desert, you know, a donkey. And it actually ends up being what's called New Edom. And there's a, I put a history in the back of the book showing how Edom influenced Rome and stuff like that from Jasher and other ancient Jewish texts. But what's really interesting, let me give you the description just from, just from uh, um, Gad, and you tell me who you think we're talking about. Okay, so this donkey is, a, is an anti-Semitic power. It says that I have replaced Israel because God now, for whatever reason, hates Israel and is abandoned her. He has actually divorced Israel and will no longer have anything to do with it. We have replaced it. We're the ones God's pleased with because we know God better than they do. At this point, it sounds like any anti-Semitic, you know, Christian or or. or possibly even Kabbalistic type thing or Islamic or whatever, but it's a very anti-Semitic group. It goes on to say that this group is headed by a single man, and this man says that he is the representation of God on earth. Well, that sounds kind of familiar, but then again, that's, that's familiar of every cult, right? Every cult says that. But I mean, we're talking about this anti-Semitic, and this is an amazing thing. God has a sense of humor. So this person is saying, you've divorced Israel. God is evil with you, even to the point that we should tra- treat Israel as a prey. In other words, we need to attack and destroy Israel because they're evil, you know, this kind of thing. That makes me think of Hitler. But at this point, God actually says something interesting. You know, you've, you've divorced Israel. God actually says, I've divorced Israel. I suppose you could show me these divorce papers? <laughs> And then he begins to, you know, cast judge, not even cast judgment on them, but starts talking to the rest of us and says, basically, you know, if there was an angel here flying around, somebody that could do, t- heal everybody they touched, something miraculous, I could understand you thinking that's godly and following it. That's the problem with the Antichrist. He does miracles. But you get a guy that's the head of a church or a group that can't even do a single miracle, and he says, I'm God incarnate or, or I have God's authority. God actually says in the book of Gad, when you see that he's a guy, he, he, he lives a normal life, he has problems and he dies, he can't do miracles, he's not immoral, and he says he's my representative, why would you listen to somebody like that? That's cool, having God saying, okay, your, your pastor all of a sudden says you need to obey him. Let's have him levitate off the stage or something and we'll think about it. Let's have him dive and be in an airtight tomb for three days and come walking out, and I'll give him a second thought. He can't do that? Shut up. (laughs) Seriously. But it gets interesting. So this this is the guy that does this, but where is this group headquartered? But how can we identify it? This is interesting. It says that this place or this group is a religious power And it's headquartered in Kittim. Now, Kittim is the old Hebrew word for Rome. Okay? Now, let's not jump to conclusions. (laughs) A guy that says he can... Okay. Anyway, but just to make sure we're... Maybe it's a different Rome. It says it's, it's it's the Kittim that exists in the north side of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, that would be uh, Italy. Yeah. Okay. So, it's Rome, Italy. Okay. Interesting. This group says that it's replaced Israel, it's anti-Semitic, and it goes on and says they think they're superior to the Jews because the Jews don't recognize that God is is Yahweh, the Word, and the Light. So they're Trinitarians, in other words. Not that Trinitarianism is bad, but let's... So in other words, there is a Trinitarian religion that kind of sort of follows the religion of Abraham, that is headquartered in Rome, Italy, that has a guy ahead of it that apparently can't do miracles, but says that he's the mouthpiece of God on earth. And this group in the end times, old Edom and new Edom kind of come together and cause a war. They seek to destroy Israel as a prey. Now, I'm not saying the Catholic Church or anybody in particular even does that or even is thinking about that now. We're talking about prophecy. If we're 100, 200 years away, who knows what it's like now? If it's tomorrow, we can probably take a guess. 
But if we think about this, it's pretty interesting. So these two things get together. They cause Russia, actually, it's defined in there, to come down and attack Israel. And these bodies, there's hundreds and hundreds of bodies on the mountains of Israel. Well, that makes me think of Ezekiel 38, right? So I go to Ezekiel 38, I'm reading through it, and there's something very curious in Ezekiel 38 I hadn't noticed before. About verse 17 or so, it says, it's talking about Rosh, and God says to Rosh, aren't you the one whom my prophets of old talked about? And I read that and thought, no, because this is the first time you've talked about it. What, uh, there's no Magog Magog war first occurs in Ezekiel. So what Old Testament prophet has talked about it before? Gad. And I found out later there's a couple of others too. So this is pretty interesting. You've, it's, it kind of all comes together. And again, I'm not trying to add to the scripture, but there's all these clues in scripture. The book is mentioned by name. We finally find it, and it's got stuff like this in it. Naturally, that would be something that needs to be hid to the end. I mean, what would have happened if this would have been out all along? Do you think there'd be very many Roman Catholics? Probably not, right? So it's not that God is setting us up, but it's just like some things have to come to a head, and there are these books for people that want to learn, and now is the time. I mean, we could yell up, I'll, I'll jump up and down, and nobody would take us seriously now because there's too many people that are anti-Semitic, but the Lord can use us to witness to some people. So um, let's continue here just a little bit. That's pretty amazing, but there's several other things in here we'll just touch on real quick, and then we'll, we'll need to close here in a little bit. But in chapter 3 and in chapter 7, um, let's see, chapter 9, it's really interesting. It talks about the Noahide covenant. And it talks about how uh, Jews and Gentiles are supposed to work together. We have um, Christian denominations and Christian cults. We have Messianic Judaism and Messianic cults. We have Hebrew roots groups and we have Hebrew roots cults. That's always going to be. You know, everybody gets things confused. But it's really interesting in here. In the chapter of the Moabite, there's this Moabite that comes up and he's... He, he works for David, he loves David, he loves Israel, he observes you know, the stuff that he can, and he says, I want to convert to Judaism. Okay, I want to become a full Jew. And David says, no, it's forbidden. The law says no Ammonite or Moabite can ever become a Jew. And he goes to say, you know, you're a believer in the Lord, just mind your place, follow him. You're not supposed to be a priest or a prophet or anything, you're not supposed to be Jewish. You're not supposed to, you cannot get circumcised. It is forbidden. You stay over there. And the Moabite's like, well, now, wait a minute. Your great-grandmother was a Moabite. So there's got to be a way to do this, right? And David says, wow, that's a good point. And so it's amazing to me. He doesn't say, let's get the Sanhedrin on this and take a vote. David doesn't do that. He's a man after God's own heart. He says, you come, I want to know that answer too. You come with me. Let me get the Urim and Thummim and we will ask. Who? God. I'm going to grab the Urim and Thummim and I'm going to ask. So he asks God, what, what's the answer to this? This is an interesting dilemma. Well, Nathan comes back later, or Gad actually comes back later, and he says, well, the, God told me to answer your question. Apparently you'd asked him a question. The answer is that women and children are mine. It's the men that cause the problems and the wars. And when I say no Moabite or Ammonite can become a child or can become Israeli, I mean no male. The women and children are different. Women marry into the tribes. So Ruth, when she got married, became an Israelite. And more importantly, her children, you know, became Israelite. But I said no and I meant no. And so this guy goes on to, you know, love the Lord and be with David and and everything. So it shows us we can be saved, but there's a difference between Jews and Gentiles in the law of Moses. We're not talking about two separate laws, but it's really interesting because I'll talk to some Messianic groups and Hebrew roots movements that go a little too far and are saying, well, maybe Jesus isn't really God incarnate. Maybe all Gentiles must be circumcised and must keep the Sabbath and this kind of stuff. And with Gad and Nathan and these other things, we see that's not exactly the case. Same thing in chapter 9. King Hiram comes and he says, I want you to send me priests. I want to be Jewish. I want to convert. I want to you know, set up a temple. I want to do all this other stuff. 
And David actually says, you know the things of the Lord. You follow the, the teachings of Noah, the seven Noahide laws, and you'll be fine. You love the Lord. You're waiting for Messiah. You're a believer. You and I are brothers. We're going to spend eternity together. But for what you ask, no. You're, you're Gentile. You stay Gentile. You're not supposed to become Jewish. That's our special thing that the Lord gave us. So it's really interesting. It's not anti-Semitic at all. But if you think about it, there are people that want to say we're Jews and the Jews are not, or we're more Jewish because we believe Messiah and they don't. That's a type of anti-Semitism or replacement theology. So we're being warned about. Everything is important. Everything's important to study. We need to study the, the festivals and the teachings and everything, but don't be entrapped by them. Don't think that you're supposed to be a Nazarite, for instance. If, if you do the Nazarite vow, you've got to sacrifice animals when you're done. And if you're going to say, well, I just won't do that part, you're messing up the ritual. You can't do that because there's no temple anyway. But what happened with Nadab and Abihu when they messed up a ritual? What happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Holy Spirit? Just learn everything, but don't be too eager to jump. Learn everything first. There's a lot of other things we could talk in here about, but it's really, really amazing. To end this, I'll just say that I am currently in negotiations for getting the book of Nathan. I do have fragments of Nathan, and they are amazing, much like this. I keep being told, no, you're not supposed to have this. OK, I'll wait. And, and I got to thinking about it. Think about this, though. If you're Jewish, and these things talk about the Messiah, you don't know Messiah's come yet, right? You think he's still coming? You need to protect the virgin and the baby boy at all costs. So you outsiders, you don't need to know nothing. Go away. That, praise God. They're serious about the prophecies. If they could just realize, if they become messianic and realize Messiah's come, then they could go ahead and, like Jesus said, what I've told you in secret, yell at, yell at the tops of the roofs, you know. Let everybody know. These things are amazing, and I just want to say that these things, when more and more of these things come out, I don't know how you're going to stay Jewish and not accept Messiah. 1000 BC, talking about a virgin birth, and the book of Nathan has a fragment in it that talks about a virgin birth. But you know the old argument. In Isaiah, it's Alma, and it doesn't really mean virgin. It means something else. They always argue words, you know. In, in the book of Nathan, it doesn't even use that words. It says that there's a young girl who has never known a man. That's descriptive. There's no other way of, it's got to be a virgin. There's no other way of doing that. This girl has never known a man, and she's holding in her arms her baby boy, and that baby boy is the Lord of all the earth and to the end of the earth. Now, we've only had two people rule the earth, Adam and Noah, and they both lost control. So we've got to be talking about Messiah. You know, so it, it's amazing to look at these things. And then, you know, it, David apparently believed in, uh, saw God for what he was and believed in a trinity according to the book of Gad. And according to the book of Nathan, he told Solomon to make sure to keep this quiet, but look for that virgin because she will come from our descendants. So keep watching for a virgin that has a baby boy. And you can medically check. I mean, you know, you make sure. But it will happen. And when it happens, make sure you protect her and him. David said, because that baby boy will literally be Yahweh in flesh. It's like, wow, David really was a man after God's own heart, you know? And it's amazing to see these things. It's like it's been the same prophecy, the same system all along the Pharisees and the Sadducees messed it up in the third century, which is what the Dead Sea Scrolls teach. So as more, again, as more and more of these come out, you know, I, yeah, I, I can see Christians tampering with this stuff. But this is 100 to 200 BC, and Gad is 1,000 BC. And this was kept by Jewish people that are non-Trinitarian that don't like Christians. But they don't dare tamper with the text, but they don't like the text. So they just kind of set it aside. But they don't want anybody else to read it for good reasons, you know. But isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? OK. So anyway, we will keep trying to bring these things out. And uh, my website is biblefacts.org. And uh, we have Tuesday night Bible studies posted sometime during the week. We're going to try to do more studies like this and, and bring out more of these scrolls as we can. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much.